Last time, we were speeding through the Sea of Cortez, trying to soak in as much beauty as possible, before crossing over to the mainland side of Mexico, where we would end our journey. We woke up next to many cacti and caves. We had anchored precariously in the dark with the engine's fuel line getting clogged, and there were many odd smells and shadows surrounding the boat. Entering the port city of Guaymas, it was clear that this was an industrial haven. The smell of fish slurry was heavy in the air, mixed with some other chemicals too. But here, the birds and dolphins were feeding, doing their best among the factories, commercial fishing boats, and slimy water. looking for the government marina, Marina Fonatur, which would allow us to shower, sleep, and drink some margaritas in town before having to complete one last task of getting the boat through the shallows and into her cradle on land. Scott maneuvered us towards the dock with like a foot of water underneath the keel. He tried to back in at first, but at the last moment let the bow spin towards the dock for a forward entry, because we were running out of depth. And under the watchful eyes of these intriguing red mountains, we took some deep breaths, happy to have arrived without anything getting destroyed, and the bilge not too full of seawater. Now we would have a chance to walk on land a bit, take a look at the town that Robbie and I had never seen before, and speak with the other boaties about marinas, boatyards, and marine supply stores. We had just beaten the heavy winds that were forecast to arrive just now. While it was obviously calm and flat here at the dock, we knew how easily the Sea of Cortez waves can kick up, so we were happy to be in port. Robbie's fish jerky was officially dry now. Time to cut it up and to pack it in olive oil. We had a couple of spice and olive jars left over from the trip. I also want to try one with just leaving them whole or shredding them instead. Once the fish was sliced and jarred, it was easy to see the beautiful birefringence or rainbow light coming off the muscle fibers. Early morning, the tide was at its highest, so it was time to attempt to move Rage towards the boatyard. At Marina Guaymas, across the bay, we were told that they had the largest and most capable lift for bringing out a boat of 54 feet. But things were looking tight as we approached the ramp. The lift was looking small for this very large boat. But the boatyard crew assured us that they would get her done. And I have seen operators drop boats in Mexico, but yes, when they say that they can get her done, they get her done, even if that means perhaps bringing in two cranes or lifts instead of one.
They balanced the boat precariously over the red dusty land and tiptoed her across the yard while everyone held their breath. Every point of contact that she made with the ground as the workers carefully set her down made us feel lighter and happier. That'll be after we have every call fixed up. If that was for you. Once she was all propped up, it was time to tuck her in for a summer nap. The troublesome galley seacock would just not unseize. Scott ended up having to saw it off, and we plugged up the hole in the hull with a plastic bung. We wanted to take a peek into the fuel tank situation as well. It soon became clear that more access ports or widening the access port would help clean out that fuel tank better. Dude, look at these are all moving pieces. Some of them are huge flakes. Remember I was telling you, it's like a flake like that, yeah, that was getting stuck, stuck on the, the bottom pickup, of the pickup. pickup. Yeah, that would definitely... Uh, all of this is debris. Some, some pieces very large, like look at this one I'm going to move here. Um, you can point the light a little side, more sideways. Yeah, there you go. You see Incredible. that, you the see that piece? Yeah. That's one of about 30 or more flakes that's large enough to even just cover the pickup completely. And all of this little dark stuff here, that's all just fine, you know, dusty rust. After cleaning and removing all drinks and food from the boat, it was time to party and to push off. Fiesta! What do you say? Don't blink, it's good, right? We returned to our own boat happily after an uneventful flight across Mexico. Our jumping doggo, Choco, greeted us at the doggy daycare, and our lovely Inesperado was waiting for us here in the canal with a dry bilge. Back to normal life, lugging jerry cans of water for cleaning, cooking, and bathing across the neighborhood. Because although they constructed a dock right next to where we are, there is no running fresh water nearby. Our friend lets us take the tap water from his property. The process is tedious, and I much rather move the entire boat to a dock in order to fill up our large water tank that way. Instead, we blow our time and we blow on the jerry cans to transfer 25 liters of water at a time. small projects waiting for us here on the boat, like replacing the vented loop that is part of our plumbing in the head, as it was leaking from its top. I ended up only swapping the little top off to replace the whole thing later perhaps when we haul out, because the small little rubber piece inside was the only problem. Normal life for me means getting back into a routine where I can begin the day with a little mindful meditation and bodyweight exercises which was made a lot easier recently when our viewers sent over a recycled wetsuit yoga mat. With hot, sunny, shadeless conditions and about a thousand construction workers pouring in around the boat, I exercise inside. The mat turns the floor into my very own little workout studio. And then there was the engine. With some thread sealing tape, I started piecing together the cooling system with hoses, connections, and couplers. 
Parts of the engine needed to be bolted back on, but several gaskets did not fit despite being sold for our model of engine. I tightened everything as carefully as possible. When it came time to test opening the seacock, the water intake for the engine's cooling system, Robbie became involved. Sketchy ass opening of the seacock. Mm hmm. Super sketchy. Like if you, you can open and close it? Mm hmm. He advised that our raw water strainer should be right at the water line of the boat so that it can easily be opened and cleaned out when needed. For now, we decided to temporarily tie the strainer to the engine compartment wall until we rebuild and soundproof the area a little better. Now we just had to connect together the tail end portion of our engine. One of our viewers sent us this elbow when my measurements were a little off and I think that we might have to end up cutting that elbow to make it of use to us. It, it's the right size to couple between our exhaust elbow and the muffler? What's it called? Not a muffler. Um, the water lock. Water lock. You guys don't want to know how sharp this knife is. <laughs> you know those commercials where they cut shoes and stuff to demonstrate how, yeah. how shockingly sharp the knife is? We're getting somewhere here. We've got our exhaust elbow and that's attaching to the water lock. Yes! And after consulting with Robbie about missing gaskets, he suggested using Gasket Maker, which was available at the local automotive shop. I only realized later that the tube came with a nozzle for applying it more easily, but it spread on well enough, and I only lightly tightened on the thermostat housing. Twenty-four hours later, I came back and tightened the piece on once more. And I could visibly see the gasket material showing a nice little cushy seal. I had been waiting for some time for an impeller to arrive by mail. Although we have about eight or more spare impellers knocking around, we did not have this particular size. The rubber ring gasket did not fit properly, of course, so we would have to see if the paper part of the gasket sealed the water pump well enough. Here I'm learning how to install an impeller. I needed to see which way the impeller would rotate when the engine is running. Okay, it's spinning that way. Robbie suggested using a zip tie to crunch the flaps into the right direction before stuffing it into place. This method actually worked well to begin to get the impeller into place. Is it working? Yeah. However, we would need a pair of pliers to push it in the rest of the way. It's halfway in. Can I open the engine? Yeah. Okay, just stop, stop. We wanted to make sure that the fluids were topped off before running the engine. Coolant into the heat exchanger and quite a bit of oil was missing as well. Check the dipstick and more oil needed. We opened up the seacock, started the fuel flowing with a small jerry can of diesel, and let her rip. The gasket I made doesn't work. <laughs> it wasn't odd that the engine was having difficulty firing up, but it was odd that water was starting to leak from everywhere, immediately. Oh, no. No 
Water was spewing out from everywhere, and with immense pressure. Salt water sprayed across the cabin and filled our bilge in a matter of minutes. <laughs> There's... is there salt water in the engine, and... the wa everything that has to do with the heat exchanger is just... water is just flying out of it. I said, screw the heat exchanger, let's disconnect it completely, and just run the engine on salt water directly now that we had accidentally done so. But Robbie had a better idea. He said, let's just switch around these two pipes connecting the heat exchanger to the engine. It was highly likely that we would get some tubes mixed up in some way because it was hard to find a manual for this device that actually showed what tubes were attached to what. After blowing on some of the tubes and pipes and observing where water came out of the heat exchanger, we swapped two of our pipes and prepared to start up the engine again. You ready? Yeah, I've got it open a little bit. I had a better idea about how to throttle the engine up and down this time and started tightening leaky connections. The salt water was now circulating through the heat exchanger and out the exhaust as it should. After a couple of minutes of running, the belt looked stable enough and we could touch the engine. It didn't seem too hot. Now we just had to make another leap and attach the engine to the propeller shaft so that the engine could actually propel us somewhere. But that's another story. Join us next time.